Thursday evening. Well, it's the middle of summer. Welcome to the festival. We're happy to have you here. I'm Jamie Beckett, the You Can Fly Ambassador for the East Coast. Down there on the bottom of your screen is Pat Brown. He fills that role for the central world. Uh, he's in Texas, the greatest state, I'm told. And way over there is K Sunroom in Southern California, where just everything's spectacular. Uh, Jose, hi, thanks for being there so early. Uh, we're going to be talking tonight about ground operations. Ground operations are actually something that people have a tendency to overlook because they think about the flight portion of flying, but ground operations are actually really important and potentially risky. So we're going to talk about some best practices and some unfortunate incidents and accidents that have happened there, just so we all have it at the front of mind. Now, our topic tonight is ground operations, but of course, you can ask us anything you want, just like Jose said, hi from Miami. Let us know if you've got a question, let us know if you've got a comment, especially let us know if you think one of us is just such a superior CFI, we deserve an award, because I, I think at least two of us do, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Kay, it, it's a pleasure to see you tonight. You've been out traveling, and you look great, and I know you just got home like 10 minutes ago, but <laughs> runway incursions are something that the FAA started getting really serious about maybe in the mid-90s, but it always has been a problem. Um, have you ever personally had an experience with a runway incursion, something that popped up that just, just totally surprised you? You know, what I'm surprised at is how uh, there's so many busy airports, but a lot of pilots don't actually take a look at the airport diagram before they go out and venture out. They do their flight planning, they do their due diligence, but when it comes to the ground operations, they haven't actually looked at where the hotspots are or what the uh, most likely taxi route they might get, and they try to figure it out as they're going along. And... Taxing is a critical phase of flight, and so you really have to uh, spend some time on the ground, particularly at the more complex airports. And we have a, a number of them here in Southern California. I know we're going to talk, be talking about one of them in particular, Montgomery. I believe we had a number of folks on the uh, on our show two weeks ago that were from Montgomery, and they'll probably be able to relate to me when I talk about those hotspots because there's multiple runways. So you really got to um, spend your time on the ground and. I've, I've seen a number of incidents where people have crossed onto runways or they've gone uh, beyond where they're supposed to, did the run up in the wrong area. There's The list goes on and on. Yeah, it really does. Now, Pat, this might seem a little off topic, but Kay used a very important term, hot spot. Now, I'm going to assume you're in a similar situation. It's the middle of summer. I'm in Florida right now at this moment. The heat index is 102. This is a hot spot of a different type. What's happening at your house? Yeah, it was about 104 degrees today, and that was uh, definitely a hot spot here. But yeah, and, and in fact, the FAA has recently updated the way they um, they depict hot spots on uh, various airport diagrams. I know we'll we'll be getting to that a little bit later. But um, this is a topic that's hard for me to relate to, Jamie, because personally, I have never made a mistake a taxi around an airport. Um, so, uh, so I'll do my best to 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 to, to be able to relate to this. But uh, no, it's a serious it's a serious topic, and and uh, um, I have a very good friend who uh, was uh, flew into Corpus Christi just a, a couple of weeks ago. And um, instead of asking for progressive taxi instructions, he went in the directions that he normally takes when he flies into Corpus Christi. It turns out that he turned on to a closed taxiway. And so expectation bias, uh, yep. you know, hearing, hearing what he thought he what, he, what he wanted to hear instead of what he actually did hear. So, and he's an experienced pilot. It, it can happen to any of us. I landed on a wrong runway before. Um, so, I mean, it, it can happen to any of us. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Now, let's do a little bit of audience participation before we jump in, just because we love our audience. And RJ, hi from Chino, California. Hi right back at you. Let me know, all of you watching out there, where are you and what's the temperature for you today? How hot is it now that we're in the middle of summer? And by the way, our producer, Donnie McKay, dodged some serious thunderstorms today, so there's weather everywhere. 
But let's let's start out with the discussion of the worst aircraft disaster ever in world history happened on the ground. It was between a Pan Am 747 and a KLM 747 on the ground at Tenerife. Donnie, if you've got a diagram there, there we go. Now, there's no taxi diagram for this one today, but that is the runway. Tenerife is a, is a big, long runway, but it's a single runway and a single taxiway. And basically what happened is 747s are too big to fit down the taxiway. It's a very foggy day. And uh, the Pan Am plane, or I'm sorry, the KLM plane taxis down and is ready to go. And the controller clears the Pan Am plane to ta back taxi and then clear the runway so the KLM flight can go. Unfortunately, there was a miscommunication. The KLM captain decided they were cleared. Now, the first officer did say, it's on the cockpit voice recorder, he thought they were not cleared. But the captain said, no, we are. Throttled up. They raced down the runway, and they're just rotating and leaving the ground when they impact the Pan Am 747. An absolutely horrendous accident, really bad. And uh, Pat, it kind of brings us to that thing, confirmation bias you were just talking about. The captain thought he heard what he thought he heard. And rather than making a, an extra radio call, just a human. And I mean, captains are people too. And just like, I'm tired. I want to go home. Let's throttle up. Just like you just talked about your friend taxiing onto a closed taxiway. We really have to be aware of confirmation bias, even on the ground. Just because we think we're good to go doesn't mean we're good to go. Yeah, you're right. I think if, I, if memory serves, I remember that accident well. Uh, there were over 500 people, I think. Uh, you probably know the exact number, Jamie, but there was, I think, over 500 people that were killed in that accident. It was totally preventable uh, if the captain had just simply listened to the first officer and said, you know something, let me confirm that. Um, and, uh, you know, th those, those, things, those things can happen. Man, such a tragedy. It really is. And, Kay, this is why I love discussing this topic on this format, because right now we've got folks from Miami, East Tennessee, Austin, Texas. I like Austin, Texas. Effington, Illinois. Denali, Alaska. Lyon, France. Marietta, Georgia. Medford, Oregon. We just got people, Bakersfield, California, Chino. We've got people from literally all over the world watching this. And whether it's Tenerife or it's your local airport, knowing what to do. And as you said, having that airport diagram, or as Pat said, asking for a progressive taxi if you need it, can make all the difference in the world when it comes down to safety. And flight safety happens even on the ground, doesn't it, Kay? Yeah, it is. Taxi is a critical phase of flight. Uh, I see people, and I have done this too, I and mean, I think we all have at some point, we're not supposed to, be playing around with the avionics and programming things, frequencies, all that, while you're taxiing. It's very easy to get distracted, and so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good about not doing that when I'm with a student, because I don't want them to develop that habit, but I have been guilty of that, and, and uh, we really have to be uh, careful about knowing what our situational awareness is, not just in flight, but on the ground, sometimes a flight can be real piece of cake and the challenge starts once you land, depending on the airport. Uh, I know I've given this example before when I leave from Palomar and I go to Long Beach or even Montgomery, it's a very, very short flight. Uh, the flight is easy. It's once you get on the ground that you really have to be um, vigilant of everything else that's going on. Yeah. You're not kidding. And, you know, you talk about programming things while we're taxing. We all have the erroneous belief that we can multitask okay. It's the other person that's bad at it. The truth is humans can't multitask. We can do one thing at a time. So, but, you know, down in your neighborhood, Kay, Montgomery, California, I think you've got an airport diagram for that. Tell us about that and, and some of the uniqueness or the hot spots that are really worth knowing about there in Montgomery. Yeah, let's, uh, let's put up that diagram. Uh, do you have that, Donnie? Thank you. So if you look, there's uh, three hot spots. But before we get to that, just look at the different runways. You got uh, runway 28 left and right, right? First of all, the, uh, the, the right pattern is for 28 right and also for 10 right uh, to keep those parallel runways, right? You want to have the traffic on the north side 
the north runway and the and south on the south side. So that makes sense. But then you also have uh, runway five and two, three, and all the different uh, taxiways. So you need to take a look at this before you get to that airport, or if you're already there, to anticipate, well, what is it uh, that I'm going to get as a taxi clearance if I'm in the transient parking? And the winds are prevalently from the west, and so you're most likely to be taken off from 2-8 left or right. And so if we look at hotspot 3 first, uh, you'll see that it's right between runway 28 left and taxiway Bravo. And if you have a clearance to 28 right, a lot of people tend to stop right there when they get to the end of 28 left. Uh, that's a common mistake instead of continuing on to hotel to Alpha and then doing the run up there. Uh, then the, the one in the middle, hotspot number one, so that's between runway 28 right and left and taxiway uh, Mike. And folks getting off of 28 right will often taxi onto Mike and continue right across runway 28 left. And that's an active runway. They do use both runways uh, quite often. So that's a big runway incursion. And then the, the one on the, uh, the northwest side, hotspot two, is between runway 28 left and 10 right, and another runway, uh, runway five and two, three. So you, you really have to know about all of these uh, before you get to the airport or before you leave the airport. And I can't emphasize how important it is to uh, know what you are going to get as a taxi clearance. And then resist that, that um temptation of doing multiple things and even your passengers, your co-pilot or your passengers can be a really big distraction. And the best thing to say is, hey, you know what, let me uh, let me just get this done. Maybe at, at the run up before I get the taxi, uh, the, excuse me, the takeoff clearance, I'll answer some other questions and then focus because if you don't, you're most likely going to make some of these mistakes that I just mentioned. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, this kind of combines that thing Pat was talking about with the confirmation bias and what you're talking about, the complexity of an airport. The deadliest runway accident ever in the United States happened in 2006 when a Com Air flight departed from Lexington, Kentucky. What the pilot, now this is just a, it's a, it's a perfect storm for an issue. It's a very early morning flight, 6 a.m. departure. So you know the flight crew's been up since 3 or so. The, the, they're up in the middle of the night. There's only one person working air traffic control. And you'll see from that runway diagram, you've got runway 22 and runway 26. This is a newer diagram. It's 27 now, but 22 is still there. You'll notice 22 is much, much longer than 27. Well, ironically and unfortunately, the run the taxi procedure to get out to runway 22 had changed just recently just within the last few days before this flight the captain did not ask for progressive taxi they went out the way they expected to go people are tired they're getting their day started and they ended up lining up on runway 26 not on runway 22 a runway that's half the length of the runway they intended to be on and not nearly long enough for them to actually get the lift they need to take off. Pat, you know, the thing that's kind of sad about this one is one of the things we teach students when we get into instrument flying especially is check your magnetic heading to the runway assignment so we confirm we're in the right place right from the get-go. Clearly that's something that didn't happen and it was a tragic, totally preventable accident but it really was that confirmation bias of I know where I'm going. It's very early in the morning and everybody's not really on their game. You've got minimum staff. There's only one person in the tower. And because of all those things, somebody ends up on the wrong runway, a way too short runway, and neglects to check it. That's a big deal, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, particularly these days, uh, it is just totally, totally preventable. Um, if you have one of the apps out there like Four Flight or Garmin Pilot, uh, I'm not so sure about Wing X or some of the others, but with uh, Four Flight in particular, depending on what level of subscription you have, um, you can have geolocated taxi diagrams. What does that mean? It means your little airplane, your little blue dot is right there on the diagram showing exactly where you are. And uh, for some of us, uh, myself included, who are a little bit directionally challenged on the ground, 
when you're trying to get yourself oriented at a strange airport and a strange FBO and a strange ramp and all of that, um, that, uh, that geolocation feature is worth the price of the subscription alone. Um, you know, I don't know, frankly, if that feature was a, a, a available back in 2006. And that certainly predates the time when electronic flight bags were being allowed in the cockpit of commercial jet airliners. But um, that, uh, that little feature alone uh, makes all the things that we're talking about today um, virtually a non-issue if you're paying attention. Boy, you're not kidding. And by the way, Christopher Ritchie asks a really great question here. I like it a lot. Christopher says, for airports that have no diagrams or poor diagrams, and those do exist, can a pilot take a screenshot off Google Earth and print it out? I'm going to say yes, Kay, because the regulation is the pilot has to be familiar with all available information, not all available FAA information. If you've got a resource like Google Earth that'll let you take a screen capture and print it out and put it in your flight bag, I think that's great. What are your thoughts on it, Kay? I think it's a great idea, too. Yeah, absolutely. Always have that airport diagram with you. Uh, I, I've seen people want to use the electronic version, but then they're on a different page. They don't know how to switch over to the airport diagram map real quick, or they have multiple diagrams and, and they're kind of fumbling with it. And so make sure that your cockpit resource management is, is good and be organized, uh, whether it's a knee board or a yoke clip, whatever the system is that works for you, just make sure that uh, you continue to do that all the time. And if there isn't a, an airport diagram, I, I love the idea of printing out from Google Earth. And there are a lot of airports where uh, some of the big aviation apps like, like Fork Flight, if there isn't a real detailed airport, they go in and they put the details and there's a Fork Flight version of it, for example. You can also go onto AOPA's website. We have a bunch of airport diagrams. And so you don't necessarily have to pay a whole lot of money. A lot of this information is free. Um, and the FAA's airport diagrams, uh, you can print it out on the kneeboard size. Just make sure you do that and then keep keep everything organized. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hey, Pat, let's, let's talk a little bit about an airport in your neighborhood, Addison, Texas. That's one you're familiar with. And it, it's kind of an interesting one from, for this because it, it doesn't look like the most complex thing in the world, does it? No, Donnie, can you throw up the, uh, the uh, Addison? Uh, yeah, okay. So Addison is an interesting airport. It's considered to be a, a, a reliever airport uh, for the DFW area, the Dallas-Fort Worth area. It's close to, very close to, uh, uh, to uh, Love Field up there, which is uh, home of Southwest Airlines. So you might look at this and say, you know, this thing looks pretty straightforward. And, and it really is. But the interesting thing about this airport is the physical distance between the taxiway and the runway is very, very short. And if you clear the whole short line um, as you're leaving the runway, as you're as you're as you're as you're turning off the runway after you land, when you cross the if, if you if you cross the entire whole short line so that no part of the airframe is still uh, uh, on the whole short, then you're on the taxiway. And so that is, those are, are all considered hotspots because you could very easily get in the way of airplanes that have been cleared to taxi on that taxiway. So it's a problem without a real good solution. You, you just have to be very, very careful because remember, all of the airplane has to be clear of the whole short line or you're technically still on the runway. So you're risking a runway incursion if you don't clear the whole short but you're risking a taxiway incursion if you taxi past the whole short. So it's a kind of bit of a conundrum, but that's Addison and every single uh, taxiway is like that. That's interesting. Is that the kind of place where maybe if you're flying out of there for the first time, you might talk to one of the locals and say, Hey, how do you handle this? Because it's probably not written in a book anywhere. Yeah. You want to talk to the locals for sure. And you really want to communicate with air traffic control, whether it's the tower or whether it's ground control, you really want to be uh, talking about uh, talking to those folks. Um, Addison is incredibly busy, and, and it's not unusual 
um, as as with a, a number of, of reliever type airports, but it's not an, unusual at Addison to be number 12 or 13 for takeoff. I mean, I, I have had to wait at Addison uh, for 45 to 50 minutes for a VFR takeoff. So, I mean, I, I just don't, I don't, frankly, I just, I avoid that airport at this point for, just for that reason. But uh, you, you got to be, you, you guys got to be careful with that particular airport. And anybody who might be watching or listening now or in the future will shake their, nod their heads in agreement that you just got to be careful about that airport. Yeah, that, that local knowledge, it really is priceless. And, and everywhere you go, there's somebody there who knows something about it that you don't know. I'll give you an example. Uh, Donnie, I think we have an airport diagram for Williston, Florida. Williston is a non-towered airport and a great airport. And by the way, if you fly into Williston, not only do they have inexpensive fuel prices, but you can buy peanut butter right there in the FBO because they make peanut butter in town. Now, You'll notice the FBO is right up at the top there where it says Williston Municipal Airport. And you can see the ramp with the airplanes and there's self-serve fuel there. There's also a great restaurant just outside the fence called the Piper Cub that's run by a couple. It's spelled different than normal Piper Cub. But it's why this airport is really pretty well traveled. But you'll notice if you come off that taxiway from the ramp and you're trying to get to runway 14, you're going to have a heck of a time. You can't see runway 14 from the FBO. You actually can't even see it from part of the taxiway. But if you were to taxi straight out, you're going to end up on runway 5. And because it's a non-towered airport, there's no one to talk to. You have to know to come out and turn right onto that taxiway and then turn right again to get around that tree line to get down to 14. Otherwise, you're going to end up down at 15 and there is no way to get from five to one four, unless you taxi down five. So it's one of those classic cases where local knowledge helps, having that airport diagram helps, and asking somebody, how do I do this? It looks like the winds are favoring one four, but I, I don't even see one four. Okay, have you ever been in that situation where you're at a non-towered airport, there, there's no ATC to talk to, and it's, it's just a complicated looking setup. Um, how do you handle that? No, I like to take a look at you know who is who is there, and even if I don't know anyone personally or I've never even been to that airport, I'll take a look within uh, one of the aviation apps. So if you're using Garmin Pilot or WingX, ForeFlight, they all have it under the airport tab. You can uh, click the F. There's an FBO button, and it'll pop up all of the players there at the field, and then I'll call them up and I'll say, Hey, I'm going to come to into this airport. Um, I was going into Kern Valley, for example, uh, this was, I think it was a year ago, and I wasn't sure about the arrival procedure with the mountains and if there was any, uh, it's, it's in the mountain areas and I know that the you know, winds pick up there and I just wanted to get some local knowledge. And so I called up and, and it happened to be the airport manager who, who spoke to me. And it was, it was just great to have that, that knowledge uh, and, um, along with just the airport diagram, that's great, but there's nothing better than talking to people who fly in and out of those airports to give you some tips. So it doesn't matter whether you know the, the, the folks or not, but you can just find that information right in the aviation apps or on our AOPA airports uh, directory online and the telephone numbers are there, emails, if sometimes they provide that, you can contact them and just ask away all your questions. Yeah, yeah I, I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. By the way, audience participation again, and I don't want to use the term lost, but I do want to ask, and I'll out myself, this has occurred to me, have you ever been momentarily disoriented while taxiing at an unfamiliar airport? And by that I mean, have you gotten onto a taxiway or, or find yourself, I, I just can't figure out where I am or where I'm going. <laughs> and that is awkward, especially at a non-towered airport. But let's talk about one more accident that maybe doesn't occur to us. Non-towered airport, Telluride, California, or Telluride, Colorado, sorry. Non-towered airport, single runway. The airplane is in the air. And as Ken was saying earlier, very often the flight is uneventful. It, it's pleasant. Everything's going well. It's an instrument flight coming into Telluride while it's snowing. 
and they're talking to approach control and they're doing everything they're supposed to do and they get clear. Okay, well, apparently Jamie's frozen up somehow. That's so. not correct. Oh, did I, did y'all oh. lose me? Okay, I think he's I think, back. Did I get lost? I think you're back, Jamie. You, you. Ah, uh, that's so embarrassing. Well, what I was saying was the airplane's on an instrument flight plan. It's coming into Telluride, Colorado. And talking to approach, they're doing everything right, but they don't call the common traffic advisory frequency. So they're unaware the runway is closed because there's a snowplow on it. They land, the right wing impacts the snowplow, tears off. Just a bad accident. Luckily, no one was killed. But imagine how surprised that snow truck driver was when a fuselage goes shooting by at 100 knots. Yeah. We can't just assume everything's okay. There could be a lawnmower, a, a snowplow, a, a FOD truck just running down the runway. We have to call that common traffic advisory frequency, even though it's not a regulation. We can operate in golf without a radio, but we really have to be aware of what's going on, on the ground, don't we, Pat? Yeah, and uh, before I, uh, I think Kay wanted to say something too, but but um, it brings to mind an accident that happened a number of years ago, and it was the subject of one of our Air Safety Institute presentations. I don't remember the precise details other than there was a regional jet, uh, a commercial um, airline, a regional jet that was coming into a non-towered field and there was a, a, a Bonanza or a Piper product. Again, I've forgotten all the details, but uh, the, the Piper pro product or Bonanza, whatever it was, pulled out to, to, uh, to take off, I think, on an intersecting runway about the time the commercial airliner landed and they collided. Now, there were, there were survivors to that. Not everybody died, but a lot of, a lot of people did. And again, there's, there's just a matter of, of proper radio communications and, and just, just be, be aware of your surroundings. These things are avoidable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Aaron Pittman has made the comment 7600, Jamie. So uh, thank you, Eric. I'm back, though. I, I have redundancy. I have two different Internet service providers, so when – I'm in a rural area. When one tanks, I go to the other. Um, Carlos is, I like this. Carlos is being out there. Miss Taxiway Yankee at Delta Whiskey Hotel once had my airport diagram out, but the signage was less than desirable. And sometimes there's construction and they take signs down or it's laying by the side of the taxiway and it's not the right one. I had to do a 180 in front of the hangar. The controlled, uncontrolled area of the airport is interesting. Pat, were you going to make a comment? Yeah, once again, I, I don't I don't mean to step on Kay because I know she wants to say something, but Donnie, can you put up the uh, taxiway diagram for David Wayne Hooks? This is this is and, and, and Car I've known Carlos for a while. And he actually lives in my neighborhood. So uh, uh, and I didn't prompt him to tee him to tee this up for us. But thank you, Carlos. Um, Hooks is an interesting airport. It's got two parallel runways. You can see one is significantly longer than the other. A one seven right, one seven left, three five right, three five left. Uh, they have this strange thing, and that's hot spot. I think it's hot spot two. It's hard for me to read on this diagram. I think it's hot spot two around some strange place called the Triangle. And unless you know where the Triangle is, um, you're going to be lost without a asking for progressive instructions. But um, uh, the 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 signage at this airport leaves something to be desired. Um, it, it really does, and you can see there's a, a tremendous number of hot spots here and some of those hot spots in in between the sh the uh, short and the long runway the little runway and the big runway is what they call it up there are similar to addison where you have such a, a short distance between those two runways or the or the actually between the runway and the taxiway that parallels both of them that uh, when they tell you to clear the runway you have to be very careful to get the airplane clear of the whole short or else you're still on the runway and they can't clear, legally, they can't clear someone to land if you aren't clear of that hot spot. So thanks for teeing that up, uh, Carlos. Absolutely. And Kay, did you have something you wanted to offer? 
You know, I was just going to mention when we were talking about the equipment at uh, uh, Telluride, there, there are a lot of times where it is beneficial to fly over the field uh, at, you know, traffic pattern. You can go do a low pass and check out what's down there, particularly in some of the more rural areas where, you know, you're allowed to land there or you got permission, but you've never been there and you really can't see it from a distance. And so it's worthwhile to just do a low pass and take a look at what's what's there because the Google map is only going to show it at a particular point in time. You want to know what's there at that moment. I actually bring this up a lot when I do rusty pilot seminars. There's a, a I think a terrific movie out there called flying again that Jason Shepard, the MZRA folks did, and I'm in it. So just a little thing, but there's an interesting thing where Jason is flying with a rusty pilot who hasn't flown in a number of years. <laughs> And they're doing pattern work at a non-towered airport. And it's about the fourth or fifth time around, and they're on final. And the rusty pilot says, hey, there's a lawnmower next to the runway. And Jason says, yeah, he's been there the whole time. We tend to focus on what we're doing. We don't look at the big picture necessarily. Do we know if that guy on the pull out on the runway? So you're right, Kay. Sometimes flying over it. Just getting a sense, what's going on here? And especially when you hear that no cam grass cutting going on, it's really worth looking around. Where is that equipment? And now i got to go back to Christopher Ritchie, who asks another spectacular question. When using a checklist, can one use a dry erase market to check off certain tasks are complete, especially if interrupted? I say yes, but I have a little bit of a twist on that. I flew with a Vietnam vet. He was another instructor. He flew helicopters. I flew airplanes. And he had a great, great manner of doing things. If your checklist is laminated, sorry, I'm just working with the new mouth for the first day. If your checklist is laminated, you can use a grease pencil and just check things off as you go. And when your flight is over, you can just clean off that laminated card and you're good to go. But you're absolutely right. If you're going to be interrupted or if you're going to be under a stressful environment, being able to check a checklist off or just say, you know what, I need to stop and go back to the beginning and go through this without the interruption. Christopher, you ask great questions, man. I really like it. Um, let's talk about, Pat, you you talked about an accident with uh, airplane tech, two airplanes taking off, somebody pulling onto the runway. August 2021, just last year, not quite a year ago, a Turkish Airlines Airbus A330 at Newark lined up to take off. They had a clearance to take off, but instead of taking off on the runway, they started their takeoff run on the taxiway that parallels the runway. Now, okay, a runway has a white line, and a taxiway has a yellow line, and a runway has white lights, and a taxiway has blue lights, and there should have been plenty of reasons for the crew to pick up on this, but just like the KLM flight, just like so many others, we're human beings and we can get in a rush and miss things. Do you have any advice for somebody who's fearing that could happen to them that they'll they'll land on a taxiway or try and take off on a taxiway not realizing? And my biggest advice is to make sure that you understand what the airport signage is and not just the ones that are really common, even the ones that are obscured, because those are the ones that are going to get you, the ones that you're not familiar with. Uh, you're going to know the ones at your home base airport because you're there all the time. But there's a ton of them, and I and I I want to um, I want to just flash this one uh, safety advisor that we have from AOPA. So this is operations at towered airports. However, um, this talks a lot about airport signage and about runway incursions and ground operations, the focus of this this show today, even though the title is is Operations at Towered Airports. And Donnie, I think you have a link maybe you can put up so uh, viewers can can uh, take a look at that later on. Or you can just go to our website and just Google uh, Towered Airports, and you'll see this PDF. You can download it. And it has a lot of great information on even signage. And let me just flip to this one page here. Because if even for those of you who are very current or instructors, you know, Reviewing signage like this every so often is going to get you out of that trouble because you're going to come across some sort of signage that you're not aware of. And it really comes down to how uh, thorough are you on that ground knowledge. And it doesn't take a whole lot of time to go through this, even if you just spend 
you know, 10 minutes reading this pamphlet, it's going to save you a ton of headache later on. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. And by the way, I want to address Carlos Montalvano's uh, thing here. And I'm sorry, I mispronounced your last name. He makes a Harrison Ford joke. And Harrison Ford famously landed on a taxiway once. And there's audio of him making the phone call to the tower and all that. I will never make fun of somebody who makes a mistake. I actually, early in my flight instruction career, I landed at the wrong airport once with a student. I, I've written about it. I've told the story before. But my student was unprepared, and I didn't realize I was unprepared because he had planned out this whole flight just using VOR radios. So I had to take the airplane from him because he wasn't flying it well at all. Canceled flight following with Boston Center when I had the airport in sight or what I thought was the airport in sight. Turned out the airport I was landing at had the exact same runway layout as the airport nine miles down the road and on the same VOR radio. And I made a mistake. I landed at the wrong airport. I had clearance to land, but not where I was. Um, Pat, I know this is maybe a, an unfair question to ask, but have you ever made an error like that? And, it's, and I'm just going to say, I, I really don't make fun of people for this because we all make errors. We all learn from them. And there's no upside to ridiculing another pilot. Have you ever made an error in flight or on the ground that you're like, oh, I can't believe I did that? Uh, how many? <laughs> Let me just start. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the most, uh, I guess really the most recent one that, that was just really cringeworthy for me. It's, it's been a, a few years, but um, I was flying over to an airport uh, west of here that has kind of an odd um, layout, two runways, actually three runways, and they kind of form a triangle of sorts. But um, um, I was cleared to land on, I think it was 1-8, and I bugged my HSI 1.8 and landed on 1.3. Biggest life. And uh, it was five minutes maybe before the tower closed. There was nobody around. And as I rolled out, I said, uh, uh, gave my tail numbers, so like to taxi to the terminal for parking. And the guy said, well, you landed on the wrong runway, but uh, turn right at taxiway, whatever, and taxi to parking. And I thought, oh, oh no. Uh, and so I went to the hotel and pulled out my computer and filed a, a NASA form right then and there. Nothing ever came of it. But uh, I mean, I, and I'm, I mean, I was a CFI at the time, not a, not a DPE, thankfully, but I was, I was a CFI at the time. And there was absolutely no excuse for it other than, than I can just say that I got distracted. Um, and, uh, and, and those things happen. You know, Kay, you mentioned runway markings. If I can just, uh, segue back uh, a, a little bit. Um, if, if, uh, our listeners and, and viewers look at the airman certification standards, the ACS in both the private commercial and instrument ACS, one of the tasks in the oral portion is, uh, the applicant demonstrates a knowledge of airport markings, uh, for all three. And, you know, you would think, well, if you pass your private pilot check ride, you should know that stuff. But apparently the FAA thinks that it's important enough because it's an emphasis item um, that they put it in all three airman certification standards books. And we're required to do that. And I am I'm usually unpleasantly surprised um, at um, at the lack of knowledge mostly from students that train at non-towered fields, um, that they don't recognize what an ILS whole short area is. Um, but there's a, a disturbing number of, of, of applicants that train at towered fields that don't know what a non-movement area line looks like, which is basically the solid line with, with some dashes on the other side uh, to separate a movement area, which is on the runway side, from a non-movement area, which is on the call it the taxiway or the hangar side, which, uh, and, and I, we've laughed about this before. Can you imagine the group of people sitting around saying, okay, we've got a part of the airport here where you can do anything you want to do. You don't have to talk to anybody. Oh yeah, let's call that a non-movement area. Um, it, it, it makes no sense, but um, reviewing those, uh, uh, those, those, those diagrams and, and, and signage, uh, 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 things like Kate was pointing out is great advice. 
Yeah, and Donnie, can we pop up the graphic for Gainesville Airport, Gainesville, Florida, home of the University of Florida, former home of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers? It's just one of the coolest places in the world. But it really goes to what you're talking about, Pat, where you can land on or take off from the wrong runway. You'll notice there's hot spot two there, where those two runways, um, really, seven and one, one, they are right next to each other. And it is awfully easy based on, and this is a controlled airport, um, two big things here that are really important about Gainesville. One is that these, air, these runways are very closely aligned at one end, and it is very easy. If you're not getting a progressive taxi, if you're not really paying attention, keep in a sterile cockpit and, and on the ball, you can easily end up on a runway when you thought you were just on a taxiway or on the wrong runway. The other thing, of course, is I once bumped into Bo Diddley at Gainesville Airport, and if you'll notice from the office accoutrements Pat and I have, bumping into Bo Diddley is a big deal for us. But uh, yeah, it's absolutely possible, you're right, Pat, to end up on the wrong runway, the wrong taxiway, um, through, through no malice. And it's not because you're, you're just multitasking like Kay was talking about before. It can just be flat out confusing. I mean, Kay, I find very often, and I mean not to disparage people, but especially long time pilots or relatively inexperienced pilots, don't want to ask for a progressive taxi because they think it marks them out as a remedial pilot. And, you know, in truth, ATPs ask for progressives. I ask for progressives all the time because I'm unfamiliar or there's been a lot of construction or the last time I was here, that taxiway was closed and I'm not sure if it's really open. Do you have any shame about asking for a progressive when you're someplace? Not at all. I've asked for progressive in the past and I encourage uh, all pilots to do so. I know in our Rusty Pilots uh, seminar, we have a slide on that. But uh, for, for those of you who haven't used it, it's just turn by turn directions. Instead of giving you an entire taxi clearance all at once, they'll give it to you step by step. And I think that's wonderful, especially at real complex airports. I mentioned Long Beach before. I was at uh, I've been to Mojave several times, and uh, even though I've been there multiple times, I'll, I'll ask for progressive, uh, depending on where I'm going there, because it can get pretty complicated on the ground. It, there's no sh shame in doing that at all. Tiffany Sams is with you. Love progressive taxi at complex airports. I, I like that. I'm, I'm with you, Tiffany. And Eric Pittman makes the comment, and Eric is a regular viewer. You should all be regular viewers like Eric Pittman. Be more like Eric Pittman. That's what I'm saying. Eric says, early on in my training, the movement and non-movement terminology confused me. Eric, if you are confused, you're doing it right. <laughs> There's just no two ways about it. Donnie, can you pop up the link? And Pat, I'll come to you. Can you pop up the link for FAA Guide to Ground Vehicle Operations? Because everything we've talked about so far is about aircraft, with the exception of one snowplow incident. But the reality is, it's not just air, it's not just airplanes on the field, is it, Pat? There's there's administrative vehicles, golf truck, golf carts, fuel vehicles, snowplows, lawnmowers, all sorts of stuff, and they can all be guilty of a runway infraction and incursion. So it's it's really worth going. This is not just hyperbole. It's worth going and picking up this PDF online and kind of reviewing procedures, don't you think? Yeah, and I also think you should practice with that in your mouth before you try to do this again. So, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it, after the show, you're saying after yeah, okay. exactly. <laughs> so up at up at Hooks uh, frequently because I do a lot of check rides up at Hooks. So I'm I'm up I'm up there. I say up because it's north of where I live. Um, I do a lot of check rides there, and of course there's fuel trucks that are going back and forth across the airport because there's hangars on the east side of the field and the west side of the field. So there's fuel trucks. There are airport maintenance vehicles that are going out. There are lawnmowers that are going out to cut the grass around the signs. And so there's all kinds of ground vehicles that, that can be out and about um, on the runway. There was a, a um, I think it was a Gulf Stream 
jet that uh, uh, inadvertently taxied down a narrower runway than it should have been taxied down and actually put the main one of the main gears off the runway. And for three or four days, there were maintenance vehicles running up and down that taxiway, um, putting um, airbags underneath the wing to try to get the the, air, the airplane back up on the on the taxiway. So, and and you know, again, if I can uh, digress just for a second, going back to the idea of progressive taxi instructions, I had alluded earlier to a friend of mine that landed in Corpus Christi, and because of expectation bias, uh, made a, a wrong turn onto a taxiway. And the, the tower controller told him to turn around and, and he turned around and he made another mistake and he got the dreaded uh, advice when ready to copy a telephone number for the tower. Uh, they had a conversation and it's been uh, escalated to the FISDO. So um, this has been six or eight weeks ago now. So and so far, nothing's come of it, but they have six months for that to for that to happen, too. So a cautionary tale. Uh, if you're at an airport, even one that you're familiar with, uh, be sure to check NOTAMs because in this case, the taxiway that he had always turned on when the wind was favoring that particular runway to go to the FBO that he always went to to pick up the, he was doing an angel flight to pick up the, uh, the uh, I think it was some blood that he was bringing back. Um, that taxiway was closed um, for some reason. I don't remember why it's not important, but uh, again, expectation bias. And, and he turned on that when he was clearly told. Oh, and by the way, there was a flight instructor in the airplane with him that was just riding down there just to keep him company and have some fun who didn't speak up because he wasn't sure he heard the taxi instructions correctly. So the, 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 uh, uh, the lesson for the CFI or just the passenger in the right seat, if he's a pilot in particular, is if you're not sure, speak up just like that captain uh, should have listened to the first officer in Tenerife. Yeah, and, and you know, that is just the saddest thing that, that doesn't have to happen. And we forget, if you're unsure of yourself, it's okay to stop and make a radio call. You know, Cavalier 102.5 makes a great point. If you've asked for a progressive taxi, you're reasonably assured you have a second set of eyes working with you. That's the exact reason I ask. If I'm at an airport where there's a lot going on, there, there's it's a big airport or it's a complex airport, multiple runways, lots of taxiways, construction, or things happening. I'm happy to ask for, for a progressive, because even in the 152, I don't want to turn left on Delta when they wanted me to turn right, and I come head-to-head -head with a 737. Now I have to shut down and get out and turn the airplane around, and everybody knows who the moron is. I don't want to have to do that. I'd rather just say, hey, can I have a progressive? And they're happy to do it, because as you guys know, ATC would much rather give you directions than have that kerfuffle of you going the wrong way and blocking a taxiway. Oh, yeah. Let, let, let's talk about some tips. I mean, we've talked about a bunch of incidents and accidents and hot spots and things that can happen, but, you know, Eric Pittman brought up the non movement area and the movement area. It can't be confusing. Pat, you mentioned it as well. I'll, I'll just say basically, runways and taxiways are movement areas. Aprons and ramp areas are non-movement areas. You can just think of them that way. And there are markings, but if you just think of it in general terms, taxiways have a letter or a letter and a number. Runways have a number or a number and a letter. They can direct you there. Once you get to the aprons and the ramps, you're kind of on your own. So even though everything moves, they call it a non-movement area. Now, K, if I'm taxiing around on an airport that I'm not very familiar with and they send me out to the runway, and I find myself on a piece of pavement, and I'm not really sure if I'm on a taxiway or a runway. Are there telltale signs that I'm on a taxiway? You know, if you if that happens, I would just ask. I would ask the controller right then and there and, and admit that you're not sure exactly where you are and uh, have them, you know, help you out from there. There's absolutely no shame. And, and if you didn't get a progressive taxi, that's fine. If you're confused or just not certain where you are on a taxiway or on about to go into the apron or maybe there's an ILS hold short line, you're not sure what that is, then stop right there and, and ask. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I like that. Pat, we color code things on airports. That includes taxiways and runways, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Taxiways are typically yellow and runways are typically white. Um, 
uh, runway runway lighting is usually white. Sometimes it will transition into red as you get towards the end of the runway, and taxiway lights are typically blue. Um, and yeah, if you as long as you're not colorblind, if you are, you shouldn't be flying at night. Um, then that stuff is, uh, is 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 pretty straightforward. But you know, I have to echo uh, Kay's emphasis on using progressive taxi instructions. I mean, we've talked about that almost ad nauseum here in the last, you know, what, uh, 40, uh, like 50 minutes and 46 seconds. But um, I, I think that's, uh, I, it's worth talking about ad nauseum because that's, that's your surest way. Um, that plus having uh, an app that has geolocated taxi diagrams. And beyond that, I write it down. Um, I, I absolutely write down a taxi clearance if I'm, especially if I'm an airport I'm not familiar with. Um, I will write down that taxi clearance and um, and and make sure that it makes sense according to my uh, taxiway diagram, which typically I have on four flight, and my little blue dot uh, is there and stays as a blue dot till I start moving. Then it turns into a jet airplane, and I just I only wish. But uh, yeah, th those are those the, the quickest and easiest ways to to avoid uh, having to make that dreaded call to the tower and face what might end up being an unpleasant telephone call uh, with the local FISDO. Hopefully it won't be unpleasant, but it certainly isn't something you're going to look forward to uh, having to do, right? Well, and you brought up that very good point of filing a NASA form, which you can get online. Um, I've filed them, you've filed them, Kay, I assume you have filed them. Anybody who's flown for any length of time has done something that might cause them to say, hey, I made a mistake. It, it wasn't, I wasn't being reckless, I just made a mistake. This is how it happened, this is where it happened, this is when it happened. And basically, friends are collecting all this stuff. If we give them good feedback, hopefully they can design a better system that has fewer accidents. Now, let me throw you both a curve because in the next two weeks, a little less than two weeks, there's a small gathering in, in cheese country up in Wisconsin where sometimes some people go there. It's really worth reading the note, Tim. Don't you agree? Kay, I, I don't know if you've flown into Oshkosh. I know, Pat, you have. But, Kay, there is a really disturbing YouTube video of a fellow from a few years ago flying to Oshkosh on purpose, intentionally, who has not read the NOTAM and doesn't have any documentation with him, and man, is it a mess. So it really is, this is not a small thing. If you're going to a fly-in of any size, if they've got a NOTAM, it really does behoove you to read that and understand it before you ever get in the airplane, doesn't it? Not only read it, you should print it out and you should have that with you the whole time. You're going to need it a lot of times these air shows uh, like Oshkosh, you know, the NOTAM is, it's, it's not a page or two, and depending on what type of arrival, whether you're VFR or IFR, you know, print out those appropriate uh, pages and review, highlight, review again and again, and then right before you fly and have it with you in the flight. There's a reason why that NOTAM was was published. It's most likely there's, there's, there's a lot of people doing the same thing, and they need to have some sort of traffic flow management so that we're all safe. And it only takes one bad apple to make the system more difficult for everyone. So make sure that you print it out and review, review, and review it again and again. I love it. I love it. By the way, audience participation again, put in the comments if you're going to Oshkosh. Just put in a raised hand icon or a big smiley face or a jet airplane, whatever. But if you're going to Oshkosh, let us know because two of the three of us just might be there. And Pat... Yeah. When you're coming into Oshkosh, it's a little different because you're not being cleared to land on a runway. You're being cleared to land on a certain colored dot on a runway or maybe on a parallel runway, which was a taxiway last year. Or a taxiway. So yeah. It really is worth getting up to speed, isn't it? Yeah, you, you really do spend, need to spend some time reading that. Um, we typically go into Fond du Lac, which is about 20, 25 miles south of Oshkosh. And the reason being is, is frankly, it's just easier. Um, but Fond du Lac is covered by that NOTAM too, as are a number of the reliever airports for, for Oshkosh. So it's not just a matter if you're going into uh, Whitman. Um, it, I think that's the name of the airport up there. 
uh, it, it's not a matter of going into that. It's a matter of any of the airports that might be serving uh, Oshkosh in kind of the, the, the greater sense of Oshkosh, certainly Fond du Lac. Uh, for example, Fond du Lac is a non-towered field, except during sun, uh, during uh, Oshkosh, it becomes a towered field, and they've got a, a, a temp temporary control tower sitting out there uh, in the grass um, on, a, on a trailer, and they've got controllers there, and they've got a tower frequency, and they've got a, a, a ground frequency. And uh, um, if you're going to pick up an IFR uh, release, you're going to pick it up from, from those folks there. And it's not like their normal operations. Now, they certainly have Unicom, and they've got AWOS or uh, ASOS. I don't remember which one they've got there. But but uh, um, if you're going to go into Fond du Lac, you, you still better read that uh, that notum absolutely or you can get in, into some real trouble and of course you know regardless if you go into some of those reliever airports it's going to get so busy I, i'll just tell you just a very quick story it's several years ago we were going into fond du Lac, and when we we got there within uh oh probably about two or three minutes of uh, the initial contact with the temporary tower and we were the only ones on the frequency and within five or ten minutes of that initial contact there must have been 30 airplanes that showed up and of course, everybody's reporting in. And finally, the tower, the temporary tower operator says, all right, listen up, everybody. You're all cleared to land. Now, let's sort this out. And I, that's not a joke. And, and then they, they reverted to the Oshkosh thing. Yellow Cub, rock your wings. White Cirrus, rock your wings. Uh, red Comanche, rock, you know, rock your wings. OK, uh, white uh, uh, you know, Yellow Cub, make a short approach. And, and, and all of a sudden, it just started going like that. And it went like, it just went like clockwork. There's no dots to land on in Fond du Lac. But you're right, Jamie, there are specific dots on the taxiways and the runways at Oshkosh. And it's sun and fun, too, by the way. And yeah, you, better, you better be ready. Yeah, I'm actually glad you mentioned that temporary tower. I'm based at Winter Haven, which is 15 miles from Lakeland. We're on nine-towered field. But during sun and fun, we have a temporary tower and we become a towered field. So being familiar with that NOTAM, knowing what's going on, not just with that main airport, but in the surrounding area, can be critical. And Jeffrey Hirsch is going to Oshkosh. He's going to be at AirVenture. So, Jeffrey, please stop by the AOPA campus. It's right there by the Brown Arch, right in the center of things. Say hey for us and, and, you know, just let them know that you've been watching Ask an Ambassador and it's changed your life and you think you're a far better pilot because of it. I think that's important that you, you say those exact words, hopefully to Mark Baker or, or somebody that's on the executive committee. That would be great. Thanks very much. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> you know, we're, we're starting to wrap things up. So I do want to say to all of you who are watching tonight, and thank you so much. We really do appreciate you. We get emails from you. We bump into you out in the world. It's so great having you here. Please like the link that you're on. Click that thumbs up on YouTube or the like for Facebook. Share the link with your friends just so they know how cool you are, that you're asking questions, or that, hey, can you believe the guy talking on this actually landed at the wrong airport once? You can make fun of me. It's okay. I can take it. Okay. Any closing comments for this spectacular really beneficial Ask an Ambassador episode. So just get really familiar with your taxi route and know your hotspots and that chart supplement with the airport diagram, make sure you always have that with you. Electronic or hard copy, doesn't matter, but know that information inside out before you go to the airport or before you depart from one. I love it. Pat, any, any wisdom you'd like to share from the great Lone Star State? Yeah, you know, just in case you think that the pros don't make mistakes, there was a Southwest Airlines uh, 737 that landed at the wrong airport in uh, uh, somewhere in Arkansas. I don't re recall it. Branson, I think. There was, there's two airports at Branson. The runways are, are, are similarly aligned 10 or 12 miles apart. And a 737 landed at, at the wrong airport. Um, there. So uh, it, it can happen to the pros just like it can to, you know, to those of us that uh, don't fly professionally. So uh, you're not necessarily alone if you should, if you should uh, make a mistake. And that's all I got. You know, and it's worth knowing and, and seriously knowing this is not an excuse. Getting from the hangar to the runway is as challenging as getting from the runway to the next runway. So take every aspect of your flying seriously. Study up on it. Talk to the locals. Read the NOTAMs. Get your weather briefings. Know what's up. 
and you're going to have a much better time. And should you err, the NASA form is there for you. Folks, thanks so much. I really appreciate you being here. I was going to say we will be back on the 26th, but I don't know if it will be we or it will be me or two of us because there's this whole Oshkosh thing coming. We just don't know. We're making it up as we go along. But somebody will be here on the 26th, 7 o'clock Eastern, 4 o'clock West Coast, to talk to you again. I'm going to try and have my mouth fixed by then so I can speak a little more fluidly. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Donnie, great production as always. Great applause to the great Donnie McKay. We'll see you next time, folks. Thanks for spending your evening with us. Bye-bye.